So today we're going to talk a little bit about Redfish and HII and uh, I'm going to kind of assume that everyone's starting from scratch so I'll go over some of the basics of the HII infrastructure and what it is, what was the point of it and at some point in time once I think you guys have had enough of me I will hand it off to Samer who will speak much more eloquently than I can on Redfish. So. Uh, so let's get started. And if there's any questions while we're going along, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of buzz through this, so ask them as we, as we go along. Uh, obligatory agenda, so we're going to go over a bunch of stuff. I'm going to cover largely the first two things. So here we go. Uh, so I, I guess I should point out that this session is going to be more about what any of these things are. You know, what is HII, how it, you know, relates to what's in the platform. And Samra is going to cover what is Redfish and, you know, what would you do with it. Uh, there is another session tomorrow that is going to be longer and we go more into the how. So how does this all work? How, you know, diving much more into a technical, uh, deeper, darker aspect of things. So. Uh, if not all questions are answered in this, I'm going to assume that probably a lot of the questions, you know, especially if they're of technical nature, we'll be covering in the next session. HII is largely talking about configuration. Uh, built into the platform, there's a lot of infrastructure involved. There's about 300 pages worth of HII spec material in the UEFI spec. Um, uh, I'm sure everyone has read all of those, so I'm going to try to cover the highlights of it and see how it applies as far as manageability is concerned and how configuration works uh, as associated with HII. Uh, okay. So one of our goals from the very beginning was to take what, you know, prior to UEFI configuration and how strings were presented and used it was all kind of a black box. Uh, there wasn't a clear and evident way of going ahead and configuring a machine from a programmatic point of view. And uh, you know, if folks remember how machines used to boot, you used to boot with um, you know lots of different things, adapter cards going ahead and advertising. Hit F2 if you want to program. You know, set me up. Uh, hit F3 for this. So. It would take a lot longer for the machine to boot because you had all these pauses for all these controllers that had their own special setup applications. One of the goals we had was eliminate all that, put the control of the configuration of the platform in the hands of the platform. And that meant that we needed to get out of a black box mentality. We wanted to be able to change it so that third party devices, as well as you know, things that were on the motherboard, were all configured in basically the same way, you know, the same mechanism would be used. And that would allow the, pro, uh, the platform to go ahead and control what was being presented as well as when it was being presented. In addition, one of the other goals that we had was uh, to enable scripting of configuration. So if we wanted to be able to run a script for any particular reason, you could do that and you know, go ahead and program a whole series of things. And you know, last and not least was the ability to go ahead and handle multiple languages in, in a you know, relatively simple way. And that wasn't only just for the motherboard, but for the third party devices. So if you think of HII, which actually stands for Human Interface Infrastructure, it, it was intended to deal with all sorts of things having to do with presenting data to the user, as well as how the platform and any of the devices that were attached to it were configured. And you know, it kind of exposed programmatic ways of going ahead and handling all this. Like I said, not a black box. This gives you a very high, uh, over, uh, high level overview of what are the, some of the basic components and, and kind of the, the general flow. So the intent here is that um, whether it's an add-in device, you know, some UFI driver, platform driver, they all export content. Uh, it, the content can vary widely. I'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides, but essentially it would all export um, their own content into some central database that the platform owned. And there's one copy of that database, it's the HI database. And from that database, several things would be possible. You'd have a built-in browser within the um, 
in, within the platform firmware that could retrieve content out of the database as well as interact with the database in different ways so that you know they could present you know like the platform could present for um, for the third party devices their setup app so you didn't have to hit f2 or some magic hotkey combination it was you know all preserved into some central database and then it was up to the platform when the user wanted uh, to be able to do it he can go ahead and uh, configure the various things that were configurable in the system and obviously the one of the other intents that we had um, is the ability to export all of that content such that others could use it even into the OS runtime. So uh, that's, again, just very high level. Um, diving, uh, this, is as far, this is as deep as we're gonna go time allotted uh, for this what presentation, but here are some of the basic interfaces that we're dealing with. Um, we have a central browser. Uh, and that's really just an implementation. You know, each platform may very well have their own implementation of a browser, but it's, it's dependent on the content that was exported to the HI database. And it would be able to render the, that information in a variety of ways so that the user could actually you know, navigate the pages. Uh, there are you know, configuration access protocols that provide the abstraction points for each of the devices that are configurable. You know, allows me to go ahead and say, if, if I wanted to save settings, you know, that would be the means by which I would do it. Like for instance, some add-in cards may save their settings on board to the device itself, which would typically be proprietary. However, even, even with it being proprietary, it's behind a known configuration interface that, we, uh, that the platform would be able to access, send things, you know, send user-initiated set settings uh, setting changes to that driver and you know if you wanted to move that uh, that card from one place to another those settings would actually be saved and uh, the database would cover a bunch of other things a lot of things that could be exported have to do with fonts images strings we'll go into a, a few of these and I'm going to kind of focus a bit on some of the basics that have to do with manageability kind of leading into the redfish discussion um, like I said, we, we do register stuff into the HI database. Things I want to focus on um, are something called IFR, and, and well, we all know what strings are, but I'll go a little bit into that. So IFR, think of it almost like HTML, you know, binary encoded. So it, it's, it stands for internal forms representation, and that's really, you know, forms is really what they are. They're binary encoding that allows um, a developer, you know, in, you know, to embed within their device or, you know, a programmer to embed into the motherboard, uh, how do you want to present questions that you want to have configured? So, and on the bottom left, I kind of show a basic rendering of what, what an opcode would look like, an IFR opcode. And uh, it, it makes references to strings and what are the certain operations. Examples of an opcode would be a numeric opcode. If you want to or a Boolean, you know, if you wanted to go ahead and, you know, present a checkbox, there's a specific opcode for checkboxes and stuff. It's in all, all that 300 pages that everybody's real familiar with. <laughs> um, and obviously we, we have strings, you know, all, you know, wouldn't be very interesting user interface without a string. So, uh, and we do have this concept of, you know, supporting multiple languages. And we tokenize all the strings such that um, if you're referring to string number one, if that's in English or in Spanish, the meaning is the same. So, hello world, hola mundo, um, they're the same meaning. So, it, you know, it allows the IFR opcode to refer to a single number, you know, a, a token number in the string, and they, they mean the same thing regardless of which language you're actively displaying. So, if we have a certain string identifier, you know, so string token number four, yeah, uh, uh, this is what it would look like. Essentially, if you look at each of the string packages, you know, there's an English one, let's say there's a uh, Spanish one, and there's a Chinese one. Uh, all of these can get rendered uh, and have identical meaning. I'm going to take for granted that, that third instance is correct in Chinese. Uh, I don't do that myself. And I did touch on this uh, briefly, but uh, 
I personally like this illustration, so I, I tossed it in. <laughs> uh, we, we have font support, so uh, and, and this is only interesting in as much as uh, I wanted to kind of bring up the concept that you know with HII we also allow you know third party devices, devices that aren't attached to the motherboard to actually bring things to the table that maybe the base platform didn't have. So for instance, if a particular device happened to have certain languages that it wanted to be able to display things in, it was possible for it to go ahead and contribute certain fonts to the base system. And, you know, it, like for instance, in Chinese, there's, there's a lot of glyphs possible. And if you happen to have certain words that maybe weren't represented in some kind of, in, in our font database on the platform, they could contribute it. So again, it takes from that block box and more cooperative mode of operations between the devices and the, and the platform itself. Um, now this is where I'm gonna start segueing into Samer's talk. One of the things that, you know, and, and focusing on the what, one of the things I wanted to emphasize is we have all this interesting binary representation of configuration data, but, with, but if you just look at the binary data, you know, from a program's point of view, you have no context. You don't understand what it means. If I'm looking at, you know, question number 23, I'm just looking at the binary information, and let's say I don't, you know, my program doesn't understand whatever <laughs> the string is. You know, what is this iSCSI initiator name? That probably means nothing to a program. However, and, and you know, being that it's question, let's say number 23 or number four or whatever, it means nothing to a script. What do you need to know? Um, you need to be able to have some kind of association, you know, you know ha somehow associate the meaning of the conf the, this blob of binary information to something that makes sense to a program. So, so we have this concept of a platform language. And all that really means is that, you know, everyone's heard of namespaces and, you know, there's all sorts of namespaces that we've dealt with in the past. So, so we do have this concept of a UFI namespace. Um, and the, the, the intent behind that registry that we have on, on the UFI website is to start listing some of these um, elements that define certain behaviors or certain functions that we want to accomplish that are recognizable. So like for instance, if I wanted to represent an iSCSI initiator name, I may very well have a string representation, you know, I define a keyword in that registry called, let's say, iSCSI initiator name. And that is intended to be a unique uh, name that has some significant meaning. And what, what a program can do is go ahead and look in the HI database, because everything gets exported into the HI database. They can look for, in the bottom left I have maybe a little small uh, for those in the back, but there's this, instead of, um, you know, English in the US, Spanish in Mexico, I've got something called x-ufi-ns. That happens to be the actual um, language designation for what, we, what I like to call the platform language. It's the, it's the language that is, corresponds to the configurable language that we define in the UFI registry. And what a program can do then is say, okay, I want to go set the iSCSI initiator name. I'll be able to go look in the, string, uh, in the string packages that are in the HI database, looking for that language pack. And as soon as I go ahead and find it, I go, oh, great, this thing has a platform language. Let me see if any of the strings that are in that, in that language are associated with the iSCSI initiator name. And if I find it, I have a means of going ahead and um, reverting back to you know, the other pieces of metadata that are in the HI database to know how do I configure it. And that's kind of where I'm gonna segue to SAMR, I think, is next. Yes. Um, and if you wanna know how that works, that's our next session. So REST API allows you out of band access to the configuration settings and the inventory and the hardware uh, information that are inside the box. But it ties to other standards like UEFI for 
what happens inside the box. So think to the outside world, I'm talking REST API, I'm expressing settings in this uh, JSON format, this JavaScript object notation, and then somehow all of those requests and the data are translated inside the box to other standards, in this case to UEFI HII settings um, and, and transported through UEFI protocols. That's at the very high level what uh, the picture looks like. Now let's just talk quickly on what REST is and what JSON is, just to set level. So REST stands for Representational State Transfer. It's a software architecture style uh, for web programming, for web interfaces. It allows you to use HTTP operations like get, put, patch, post, your standard HTTP operations over well-defined resources uh, or objects. The resources in this case are your configuration settings, your inventory data, your, your health monitoring, all the different uh, pieces that you want to extract from the hardware or you want to configure in the hardware. In this client server example, the client is sending an HTTP post request to the server to some uh, weather service, let's say, at, uh, implemented on this web server with a payload that says the city is New York and the units are uh, in Fahrenheit, deg degrees Fahrenheit. And the response body back for that HTTP request will be JSON encoded and in the body itself you get the low temperature 73 degrees and the high temperature 83 degrees. And that payload that you saw in that transaction is the JSON, the JavaScript object notation that we are talking about. Very simple uh, language that uh, works very well for data structures, for expressing uh, uh, programmatic uh, elements of, uh, of data. It has the advantage of being in text, so it's human readable. You can edit it in a text file and, and see it on, on, on the wire or in, uh, in interfaces. It's also very easy to work with programmatically. Now let's go back and talk about DMTF. So DMTF is this uh, standards body similar to UEFI forum. Within DMTF, they have working groups, very much like the UEFI ha forum has the UNST, the UCST, the Shell sub team. So one of the forums within DMTF is the SPMF, the Scalable Platforms Management Forum. The SPMF is the birthplace of Redfish. That's where the Redfish specification is defined, uh, along with uh, the schemas and uh, a bunch of other stuff. You can see here the promoters and supporter companies of the Redfish specification. Um, as a UEFI forum, we do have access to uh, Redfish work on things related to UEFI, and I'll explain that in a second, even if your company is not a member company of, uh, uh, of SPMF, of the Redfish forum itself. The SPMF publishes the Redfish specification at, the, at that developer hub, so you can go there and, f and find all the specs, a schema. They have live mockups for different types of servers, like a rack server, a blade server, or an OCP. Uh, open compute uh, profile. There is a GitHub repository that's uh, uh, starting to show some activity of open source Python tools and otherwise some tools to play with the Redfish uh, service uh, and even a user forum where you can post questions and interact with the developers. The DMTF has a work register with the UEFI forum that allows both entities, the DMTF uh, organization and UEFI forum and its member companies access to work in progress and unpublished specs relating to each other's work. So for instance, UEFI forum members can access SMBIOS spec that's still work in progress. Uh, that uh, uh, agreement has been extended earlier uh, this year to allow access to Redfish specifications. So if you have not uh, seen some of the work that is uh, going on other than the work that's published on, uh, on Redfish uh, website and you have questions or you want to follow up and get um, uh, more details through USWG, through the UEFI forum, if you are a member, we can make those specifications available. At a high level, uh, uh, without going into details, that's what tomorrow's session is for, um, when you are interacting with that web service, with that REST service, what you see, and just to give you a, a sense of the type of information available uh, that has been already standardized through the Redfish specification, include things like access to BMC settings, the managers, access to 
the computer system itself, the physical view, the chassis, as well as the logical view, access to CPU, inventory, memory, uh, information, uh, disks and adapters, uh, disk controllers, physical disks, logical drive configuration, access to BIOS HI settings, secure boot, TPM, powers, thermals, uh, errors, um, you name it. And if it's not here, well, I guarantee you there is some work in progress spec to, to add it. To give you a flavor of some of the data and what uh, they look like, here are a few just uh, screenshots, very quick screenshots of uh, some uh, uh, objects available through the REST interface. If you go to uh, a BMC that has a web uh, uh, service enabled in the BMC and you access the Redfish interface, you start by seeing uh, the service route, and I apologize to those in the back if you can't see it, but the presentations will be available uh, online. We can, from the service route, you get access to all the links that get you to all those other resources, very much like that graphical tree that we showed in the previous slide. And if you dig deep down into that tree and you get to a computer system, for instance, so that would be at that IP address, that HTTP IP address of the BMC slash Redfish V1, and eventually you end up at systems one. So the computer system that's managed by that BMC, you will find things like boot order, where you can control the one-time boot, like the boot next variable, the boot order, the permanent boot um, um, override, uh, even the UEFI device path for the one-time boot device. You can power down the system, restart it, shut it down. You can, from there, access the link to the BIOS settings. And here goes my HII settings with the XUEFI strings that Mike talked about, that programmatic, uh, the, those programmatic keywords that are embedded in that special string package in HII can be translated to those name value pairs that you now can access through this programmatic interface through, through sending HTTP requests to the BMC I can now get and set every BIOS setting that's available through the HI, through the BIOS setup menu. I can also change the passwords or reset all the BIOS settings to defaults. Those actual name value pairs, those what we call the BIOS attributes, can be vendor specific. So Redfish does not dictate what those settings are. Every OEM, every BIOS vendor implements a different set of, of BIOS configuration parameters, right? But the framework of how you extract these out of HI and how you present them through the Redfish service and then how you apply the settings back into HI can all be uh, standard. In addition to the name value pairs of the actual settings, if you want to expose the rest of the HI metadata, what Mike referred to as the IFR forms, the, um, the metadata that tells you what this setting is called in English or in Spanish or in Chinese and what's the help text for it and in which page it shows up and what's the setting above it and the setting below it and what are the possible values and the maximum and minimum values, etc. All that metadata can be made available through the Redfish service in what we call a bias attribute registry. And tomorrow we are going to go through a deep dive of showing you exactly how the HII metadata and, and the HII spec map to these, uh, this format, this attribute registry format. A couple more words not related to HII. Redfish allows you also to expose secure boot settings. So you can access your secure boot current state. You can enable or disable secure boot. You can reset the secure boot databases. You can put the system in setup mode all programmatically through that uh, BMC HTTPS uh, interface uh, in order to help in deployment. For example, you want to put the system in setup mode so you can customize the content of the secure boot databases and then re-enable, reseal the secure boot by repopulating the PK. You can do that uh, uh, through the Redfish interface. And finally, the Redfish service is not limited to configuration. In fact, very recently, um, with the latest uh, schema release um, from, let me see, this is August 20th, when this was published, uh, the uh, interface now has the ability to do firmware updates, which means you can talk to the BMC out of band, 
using this REST interface and tell the BMC, I have some firmware payloads sitting here on my FTP site or on my HTTP. Here is the URL for this uh, firmware binary. Please download, grab that firmware binary and apply it to that device, to that I.O. adapter or to that BIOS or to that NIC. Redfish spec does not state how that is done. Uh, we can talk about that more to in tomorrow's session and, and follow up later with the uh, UEFI forum if there is more work to be done in the future. So thank you. And if there are any questions, we ran out of time, so you can't ask questions. <laughs> can we take a couple of questions? Gary. The interface, so the question is how, this is very powerful, how is it secure? So the interface requires HTTPS. You cannot access it on unencrypted connection. So the connection itself is encrypted with TLS. Um, you have to authenticate with a BMC account that have sufficient privilege. Every resource in the service requires certain privilege to, re to be read or to be written. And in order for full manageability of everything in the system, you need a BMC account, so you need to log into the BMC with a BMC account that has that highest sufficient privilege. Now, there are more questions and, and, and deeper discussion on, well, what if you are doing bare metal and you don't know your BMC credentials yet, and what do you do? There is a lot of uh, very interesting work that's happening there. I wish if uh, Jeff Bobson was here, he would uh, have a few uh, very interesting things to say about that. But that's work in progress in the Redfish Forum of what do you do on uh, bare metal servers, and that's something we'd like the UEFI Forum to participate in as well.